a bachelor in biology from Tufts University, a master's in marine science from Cal State, Moss Landing Marine Labs, and a PhD in marine estuarine and environmental science from the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. She's a fisheries scientist who's broadly interested in understanding the structure and dynamics of fish populations and has a primary goal of enhancing our ability to sustainably manage fisheries and ecosystems as a whole. She's particularly motivated um, to understand the role of complex population structure and connectivity and how those uh, intertwine to influence population productivity and stability in regional and local populations. And she has um, a diverse repertoire of current work ongoing uh, that includes understanding the influence of climate harvest and management on fisheries resources, advancing the study of uh, fish population structure and its implications uh, for sustainable management of fisheries resources, and finally applying management strategy to evaluate and develop improved approaches for stock assessment. Lisa is also very active in advising on regional and international fisheries management. So with that, thank you very much, Lisa, for, for joining us today. Um, and we're looking forward to your talk. Great, thank you for that introduction. I'll bring up my talk. Slowly thinking about coming up. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. All right. Now, Matt, can you just let me know, if, can you see that in the full screen version? Uh, yes, I can. OK, great. Great. Well, um, thank you so much for inviting me to talk today to all of you. And um, it's been great to see the other talks so far have been really interesting and uh, thought provoking. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about population diversity and its role in the resilience and stability of fishery resources. And I guess before I got started, I was going to talk a little bit about my background and how I kind of ended up talking to you today about this topic. And my interest in this topic really starts from my PhD, where I um, examined life history and population diversity of white perch um, when I did my PhD at University of Maryland. And from there, my work really expanded to looking at these topics of diversity in um, life history forms and in populations and variety of species, including Atlantic herring, um, as sebastes or um, rockfish species, Atlantic cod, Atlantic bluefin tuna, and striped bass, uh, among others. And along that path, I um, a lot of my work during early on focused on stock identification. So identifying what is a unique spawning population or what is a unique um, spawning contingent of fish. And, you know, over the course of um, my work, you know, I, I saw, I felt a lot of frustration at some of that work not making its way into the assessment and management process and kind of getting to that impact um, phase of the work. And so, um, really pursued an interest in um, develop some skills in stock assessment modeling and fisheries modeling to really work to integrate that information into um, our fisheries models so that we can see how, you know, understand the value and impact of, um, you know, incorporating biological population structure into these models. And so this really led me to play an advisory role in some various, in various institutions, including ICES, where I've been an uh, advisor on stock structure issues for several years now, as well as uh, for ICAT, where I, I'll talk a little bit about my involvement in Atlantic Pluvin Tuna, as well as more locally um, in our New England Fishery Management Council and uh, uh, for NOAA, as we start to undergo in our region more reviews of stock structure. 
um, than we have previously. So today I'm gonna give a little overview of the value of population diversity and address these three questions. How can we manage to preserve population diversity? How do we know when we have a misalignment between our biological populations and stock units? And how do we address this misalignment um, when we know it exists? So I hope today I can kind of convince you of this statement that you know population diversity is an important feature that can contribute to resilience and stability of our fishery resources. And these terms are used a lot in different ways in the literature. So I've defined them here in the way I'm referring to them with resilience being the ability to recover from a disturbance or perturbation and stability being the ability of a resource to maintain its integrity and persist despite year to year variation. Now, the value of population diversity can be thought of as akin to a bet hedging strategy, whereby unique populations will express unique demographics and dynamics, and therefore respond differently to outside forcing by the environment or through fishing. Now, this heterogeneity of response can add up to the idea of essentially not putting all your eggs in one basket. And so you're not relying on one single population to carry a fishery through um, or to withstand changes in ocean conditions over time. And this phenomenon has also been referred to as a portfolio effect, uh, with a portfolio effect essentially being the idea that a more diverse portfolio is usually gonna fare better when conditions are apt to change, whether it be a volatile stock market or a dynamic. Um, marine ecosystem. Um, so you can see this uh, volatile stock trading that many of you probably heard about that happened recently, or this uh, GameStop uh, stock, uh, where some people experience high highs, but also um, low uh, subsequent lows. And there's been extensive work in the marine ecosystem context on um, species such as sockeye salmon in Bristol Bay, Alaska. Uh, where, you know, looking across different runs of sockeye salmon, you can start to see how there's a stabilizing influence um, with the idea that these unique runs have some asynchrony in their response to um, changing environmental conditions. So at the aggregate level, you have this stabilizing influence uh, of these multiple contributors to the resource. So, you know, when I talk about the value of population diversity, it's not just the fact that there's multiple populations, um, because in that we can have instances where there's multiple populations, but they're kind of responding so similarly, they almost act uh, as if they are one population. And so that's shown here in the figure that shows you the synchronous responses. So if you have multiple populations kind of responding in synchrony, you're kind of not getting that, um, you know, benefit essentially of um, population diversity. Um, but when we have um, populations that respond differently to the environment um, or to fishing, you can see these asynchrony, asynchronous responses, which are shown here. And so it's not the idea of just having multiple populations, but the underlying differences between them. So these can be genetic differences, demographic differences, or ecological or functional differences that these populations express that can result in these asynchronous responses to environmental conditions. And this is gonna reduce your interannual variability in the aggregate of the resource. So you can see that in sort of the uh, thick black line under the asynchronous responses. So when we think about what the value of this uh, might be not only for the resource, but also a fishery, you know, this kind of um, diversity can enhance catch stability over time for a fishery and ultimately reduce economic risk for that fishery. So this need to think about um, preserving factors that contribute to stability and resilience is certainly very important in the context of climate change we're experiencing. And so, um, I lost my screen there. Did you lose that, Matt? Yeah, I lost it. Okay, not sure where that went. Uh, hold on one moment. Okay. 
sorry about that. It's going to go through this this slow uh, the slow load uh, loading up my process again. No worries. All, All right, right, you're back. I'm back. All right. Um, so, you know, and, and we think a lot about resilience in a changing climate. Um, in the, I think a lot about it in the context of my work in the Gulf of Maine, because we are a region that's experiencing, um, you know, pretty rapid warming over the past 30 years. We've seen warming rates that have out are um, kind of three, three times the global average and a recent decadal warming that's among the fastest in the world. And we're projected to continue at this above average rate of warming in our region into the future. So we've already seen some adaptations to this recent climate change that include things like changes in the timing of migration of fish like salmon and the timing of spawning or aggregating on a spawning location, such as um, we've seen in populations of striped bass. And we know there are certain genes that are associated with thermal stress tolerance that we might want to be preserving and kind of our uh, portfolio of populations to ensure that we have persistence into the future. So I mentioned before that population diversity can confer some stability to fisheries, um, but fishing can also be part of the problem and can erode population diversity. And this oftentimes happens when there's not really some explicit valuing of diversity and management for it. Uh, or misalignment between our populations and our stock units. And so one of uh, kind of classic examples in the Gulf of Maine um, of a loss of um, population diversity is uh, for that, uh, that example of Atlantic cod. And this is on the map, map on the left, you can see a historical reconstruction by Ted Ames of um, spawning contingents of cod that occurred off the coast of Maine. And these today are essentially considered to be functionally extirpated due to um, historic fishing in the region. And so um, this is an example where, um, you know, we really haven't seen a recovery of uh, the resource to a large extent um, because of the early fishing that took place and the loss of these uh, unique populations. The loss of unique spawning components is also considered to be one of the factors in the decline of Northwest Atlantic cod stocks in Canadian waters. So how, you know, sort of recognizing the value of this, of, of population diversity, how can we then think about managing to preserve population diversity? And I think, you know, one of the first things to remember um, is that we don't typically manage marine populations, rather we're managing a stock unit. And um, sometimes these, directly relate to each other, but sometimes they don't. And so by population, I mean a self-sustaining group of individuals that are kind of growing together, reproducing together and dying at the same rate. And these are defined genetically. Whereas stock here, I'm just defining this as an exploited unit of fish that's gonna be defined more geographically by stock boundaries. Um, and so sometimes these align and sometimes these don't. So for management purposes, uh, though, stocks are considered to be discrete units that can be exploited independently. And if we have an instance where we are having harvest occur in a mixed stock, um, the underlying um, focus should be, or we, we should be thinking about how we can assign these catches back to their stock of origin and kind of satisfy that assumption that these um, units can be exploited independently or sorted back to their um, stock of origin. And so a kind of a classic example of stock mixing or where populations and stocks don't necessarily align is Atlantic bluefin tuna. So shown here uh, is a map of uh, the Atlantic basin. And um, we know there's two, um, or, well, the bluefin are managed as two distinct stocks, west and east with a management boundary around the 45 degree meridian. And we know there's uh, at least two primary spawning grounds, one in the Gulf of Mexico shown in blue and one in the Mediterranean shown in orange. And uh, we also know that the fish, you know, there's been extensive tagging and genetics and olith chemistry to understand a mixing across this uh, kind of management boundary in the middle of the ocean. And we know there's lots of mixing that does occur um, across this boundary. And so it's important to note that, you know, 
it's not only the rate of mixing that's occurring across this boundary, but also the relative abundance of these two stocks that has you know, a real impact on what the stock mixture looks like within each of these um, management or stock areas. So in many instances, the spatial scale of our stocks were defined based on our state of knowledge in the 1960s and 1970s, particularly in the, in the US um, East Coast. Um, and so really this was the state of knowledge we had about stock structure at that time, about um, the distribution of the stock and um, how the fishery exploited that at that time. But you know, obviously our, our techniques and methods have advanced considerably since this time. And the more we look, and by look, I mean, the more we um, apply stock identification methods, the more we tend to realize that there are these mismatches in the scale of our biological populations and our management units. And as a result, there, we're increasingly finding these instances where we're exploiting fish in our fisheries from different origins. I got a little out of sync here. All right, some of that, some of those lines aren't showing up, but I'll, <laughs> that's all right. Um, so, what are the potential implications of ignoring stock mixing? Um, I think there's sort of a danger here that can really lead to sort of a clouding or a clouded perception of um, the dynamics of a stock when we ignore that there's mixing going on. So um, on the example uh, of this, uh, you have this example on the left of two populations, one in blue and one in orange, and how they evolve over time within each stock area that they're defined in. And so uh, population, the blue population here is sort of staying static over time. And you see that the orange population is growing over time. So in the context of how they're perceived uh, as um, stocks, um, because of the stock mixing that happens here with between stock um, population one and two and stock A, we can actually have the perception that um, both stock A and B are growing, even though it's only really population two that's on the increase. And so this is just kind of an illustration of how we can get um, these misperceptions happening about the status of stocks and their trajectories over time. So there's lots of ways that we can kind of confound our perception of a stock in terms of um, the catch and our estimates of fishing mortality. It can kind of, ignoring stock mixing can confound our understanding of our indices of abundance and how we draw conclusions about stock size. It can make it really hard to define a stock recruit relationship sometimes because you are relating a mixture of populations to um, recruitment events that may not be the product of um, those spawning populations. And it could be um, challenging to accurately define life history, life, life history parameters when you're doing it based on samples that are um, a, a composite of populations. So in general, I think meeting the goal of sustainable fisheries management can be really challenging when our management units don't match the scale of our fish biology. And so there's a couple of different axes on which this can affect, um, affect us. It can affect the sustainability of the resource when we have kind of unintentional overfishing happening um, by not accounting for mixing between populations that might have be able to sustain different levels of harvest. It can even affect the profitability of the fishery. In some instances, you could be in a situation where you might be actually underfishing um, a resource based on um, a lack of rec recognition of the stock mixing that's happening. And then, you know, sort of at the extreme end and kind of the worst case scenario, we're actually um, impacting our conservation or bio biodiversity goals and experiencing extirpation of local spawning units like I described off of coastal Maine for cod. So how do we know when we you know, have a misalignment between biological populations and stock units? Well, um, we do what, what's um, termed mixed stock analysis to determine this. And mixed stock analysis essentially involves using an established stock identification technique. Um, and these can range from genotypic or phenotypic traits. You're all uh, familiar, probably familiar with many of these such as um, uh, SNPs, uh, Oleth chemistry, um, body morphometrics. Uh, there's a lot of different 
alternative methods that can be used here. And they can be used to enable a quantification of the origin of fish across broad spatial and temporal scales. Uh, I particularly work a lot on natural tags, uh, particularly otoliths, um, and these are really neat, um, neat applications because they can essentially act like birth certificates for a fish. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about natural tags and um, what we can do with them. These are naturally induced characteristics that can be used to identify members of a population. And so one of the neat things is you sort of have um, by virtue of being born in a certain place or being in a nursery area at a certain time, um, your fish is essentially tagged uh, uh, with the features of, um, of that habitat. And many na different natural markers have been used to identify fish populations. There's lots of different body characteristics like uh, body morphometrics that can be used, otolith characteristics like otolith chemistry, as well as otolith structure, tissue characteristics like the chemical or fatty acid composition of tissue, and other features such as uh, parasite, um, uh, parasite identification. And I think one of the nice things about natural tags is unlike an applied, ta applied marker like a um, physical tag, these do appear on all members of a group or population and uh, essentially that appears at no expense to researchers. Um, so you just, it's really a challenge of figuring out what that, what that useful natural tag is for your particular question or species or population of interest. And another uh, important feature uh, when, you're, when we're doing mixed stock analysis um, using natural tags is the composition of fish that you're gonna find in a certain area or in a fishery is not only a result of how much mix mixing goes on between populations, so the size of the arrows, it's also a result of the relative abundance of the populations that are mixing, so the size of the circles here in this case. And so um, you can have low levels of mixing, of course, but you have uh, dispor disproportionately different sizes of population. This can have huge impacts on the mixed stock composition of fish in a certain area. So I'm gonna give a couple examples of the type of mixed stock analysis uh, I've worked on in the last few years. Um, we've been working with, I've been working with collaborators on mixed stock analysis of Atlantic cod. And so here we're using chemical composition of the um, core or year one um, growth of the otolith to identify um, a population of origin for cod. And so we term these two populations in Western Gulf of Maine, winter and spring spawners. They're really um, neat, physically overlapping group that actually have temporal differences in their time of spawning and are genetically unique, which is really kind of fascinating given their physical proximity to each other. Um, and so we did identify some unique chemical characteristics of um, these fish due to the differences in their timing of spawning. They have unique chemical composition uh, in their first year of life. And uh, in the upper hand corner shows just one of the sweet elements, elemental ratios we use to identify these fish, uh, strontium calcium. Um, but with otoliths, um, uh, because there are archives, archived hells held um, by NOAA over time, we're actually able to kind of go back in time and not only look at um, recent collections that we made in the um, 2010s, but go back in time and look at some snapshots of the composition of the fishery for cod on the Gulf of Maine and how the composition relative uh, abundance of these two or relative uh, composition of these two stocks was present in the fishery over time. And we, and we see this shift over time from kind of a dominance by the spring spawners to what we're now seeing is a dominance by winter spawners, which is kind of an interesting uh, phenomenon. We've also done this kind of work um, to examine the mixed stock composition of Atlantic bluefin tuna in the Gulf of Maine fishery for this um, species. And here we're identifying, using um, olith chemistry again to identify the origin of fish. So whether these fish came from um, the West or um, the Gulf of Mexico, or whether these fish were born in the Mediterranean and came from the East. And so one of the astounding things here um, that we're been unraveling through um, several research projects now is the, is the dominance of Mediterranean origin fish in our Gulf of Maine fishery. So these really are the primary fish that are being, current, are being caught in recent years. And we can also kind of start to break down the data in different ways and look for patterns and something, uh, one interesting phenomenon is kind of seeing that the largest fish that are caught are actually more um, 
likely to be of Western origin or born in the Gulf of Mexico compared to um, the Mediterranean. But this is a clear example of um, the idea that it not only matters what the mixing rate is, but the relative abundance of um, population. So although these mixing rates seem quite astounding, when you look at the order of magnitude difference in the population and um, in the, in the stock abundances in the east and the west, uh, this makes more sense. That eastern stock is estimated to be um, remarkably higher than the um, Western stock, so even a small amount of mixing can really have an influential impact here. So um, there are some important logistics to doing mixed stock analysis. You need um, baselines, so you need some marker uh, um, established in known origin fish for your populations that you really establish the signature, whether it be a chemical signature or an odorless structure signature um, or a genetic signature of a known origin fish. And then um, you want to uh, ensure that there's sufficient differences in whatever trait that you um, uh, my slides are moving independently <laughs> right now. I'm not sure what's going on, Matt. It, it's yeah, uh, I don't know. Suddenly it will do that, and it will kind of like um, get a, a mind of its own. Maybe we'll try to share it a different. Um, I don't know if it makes sense to share through a different, like um, not through the browse function, if that's. I mean, you could uh, just simply do the screen share. So bring it up in, in PowerPoint on your computer and then screen share it. All right, I'll try this one, try this route one more time and say, yeah, all of a sudden that will. Uh, It looks like, yeah, it looks like, so someone just made a comment. It looks like someone all, all of a sudden like takes control of my slides and moves the slides. So that may have, or like inadvertently. Yeah. If someone's maybe clicking on it or something. Anyway, it's loading back up. So we'll be back. <laughs> Sorry for all the technical issues. All right, I think this is where I was. Um, yeah, so there, when, when you're doing mixed stock analysis, there's some important considerations. You wanna make sure you have a good baseline. You wanna make sure you're picking some traits to distinguish fish that are stable over time and have sufficient differences between your, show sufficient differences between your populations. And ideally you wanna, um, oh, let's do it again. Um, ideally, you want to um, base a oh, sorry, I was just reading this note. Um, yeah. Do you, do you advise me doing something um, doing something different, Matt? No, sure let me or... let me get into um, just quick. Let me get into uh, the guts of this and see if I can just change who can present to specific people. Okay. <laughs> Maybe someone wants me to just speed up so they're wanting to, <laughs> <laughs> they're moving. In the meantime, do you want me to keep going, Matt? Yes. All right, okay. All right. Um, so, and then, um, Additionally, when you're doing mixed stock analysis, it's really important to consider, you know, your sampling design and how you're um, sampling your mixture of a population and what you're looking to characterize. Like, are you looking to characterize the mixture of a fishery in a certain area and you want to kind of take those features of what you're trying to characterize into um, consideration when you're doing your sampling. And of course, there's a whole host of statistical approaches for doing the kind of classification you do to assign fish back to their um, stock of origin. So I, I've described just a couple examples of work I've done, but um, when we actually go to draw conclusions on biological population structure, we really are looking to um, synthesize 
work across many projects um, using multiple techniques. And so our common practice when we're looking to really make a comprehensive conclusion on biological population structure for uh, a, a species, we're doing a comprehensive multidisciplinary review of available stock identity identity information. So we're kind of going through each of the techniques listed, uh, listed below, and there are others as well, and kind of looking to do a synthesis on each individual di discipline on its own to determine, you know, what does the genetics tell us? What does the otolith chemistry tell us about biological population structure? What does the tagging tell us? And so we look at these all uniquely on their own. And then secondarily, we go into the phase of doing an interdisciplinary analysis to draw a real synthetic conclusion about population structure. So this is really really where um, it's necessary to get these experts in the room together to work collaboratively and to characterize biological population structure through a process of comparing conclusions across different techniques, looking for congruence or lack of congruence, and really building a case for what the um, what the majority of the information supports in terms of, you know, our view of biological population structure. And um, this process really, I think, allows you to draw a robust conclusion. And so I've been involved in this kind of work for a while now. Um, I've chaired the IC stock identification methods working group um, for the past few years. And this is a process we routinely go on where we go through, where we bring experts together, we get, um, tasked with a particular question about stock structure for IC stocks. And we do this, go through this kind of uh, review and interdisciplinary analysis. Um, and a lot of this work has been synthesized um, in a stock ID methods work, uh, stock ID methods book that um, is informed by a lot of the folks who are involved with that ICs group. So just to give you an example of this process in action, this is something that's happening actively in my neck of the woods. Um, led by NOAA, who put together a um, Atlantic Cod um, stock structure working group uh, about two years ago. And there's um, uh, members both in the US and Canadian um, scientists here. And we have been over the past couple of years going through this process of doing a comprehensive uh, multidisciplinary review of the available information on COD stock structure. And it's been synthesized in this uh, NOAA technical report that's um, maybe not quite public yet, but about to come out. I'm not sure if it's available online yet. Um, but after going through this disciplinary process, we did get together um, as a group and work through the interdisciplinary analysis to draw a real synthetic conclusion about what we think um, the biological population, population structure for cod is in US waters and really found um, you know, something that differs pretty considerably from our existing two US management units. So COD is managed as a um, Gulf of Maine and a Georgia's bank unit. And on the um, right-hand side, you can see our conclusion about what exists in terms of the uh, biological stock structure. Here, we think there's a Georgia's bank stock, a Southern New England stock, a Western Gulf of Maine winter spawning stock, and a Western Gulf of Maine spring spawning stock, and an Eastern Gulf of Maine stock. And so we're now embarking on this process to understand now that we have this holistic review of stock structure, what can we do with it? Um, how can we address it in um, the assessment and management processes? Um, so this kind of brings us to this question of how do, how do we go about this when we, we, you know, we have the information, we've, we've identified some misalignment, how do we work with this information? So there's really a range of approaches for improving assessment and management when we have these mismatches in the scale of our biological populations and stock units. Uh, you know, sometimes we're really on the left-hand side where we realize that there is some misalignment, but we still don't have sufficient information to really move that into the assessment and management process. And we're really still, um, you know, you really still need to be in the data collection process at that time. But other times, you know, that information matures and we're able to kind of, think about uh, a variety of options we can apply to better align our stock boundaries and our population structure. So some of the best practices in kind of going through this approach of integrating biological population structure into assessment management involve kind of first doing this holistic review of the stock identity information that I just spoke about. Secondly, kind of working through the process of identifying, you know, what are the alternatives for assessment management options out there that can better consider the biological structure we know that now exists. 
And then we need to really be a bit practical too. There are always these practical limitations that we need to um, acknowledge. Sometimes it's a data limitation. Sometimes, um, you know, there's there's various reasons why we can't perfectly align our stocks and populations. And I think we also need to evaluate the outcomes of alternative options. Um, you know, there are a whole host of options to um, think about relative to the biological, economic, and social objectives we have for our um, fisheries management. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about, um, spe more specifically about what some of the options are in that I've seen applied in different fisheries. Um, you know, and when one option is always do nothing, um, not, not a great option sometimes, but sometimes there simply isn't sufficient information to change the current management practices. Um, you know, um, bluefin tuna is a is an example where we haven't, we, we know, we've known for a while there's a um, lack of alignment between the biological population and stock units. And I wouldn't say that we haven't, there's nothing's been done, but um, work is ongoing and it hasn't quite reached its way into um, fully being implemented into the management structure, although it's underway. Um, and so sometimes it's just that um, it takes time to get this work into um, accepted in assessment and management context. Um, I've seen examples of what I call weakest link management. Um, so sometimes there's uh, information that there's stock mixing or mixed stock fishing going on, but there's not sufficient information perhaps to uh, explicitly manage all the spawning components uniquely. And so in some cases, this is the case of herring I'm mentioning here in the North Sea, um, there is in a concerted effort to just um, conserve the what's assumed to be the weakest spawning component of um, the group through some explicit management measures targeting that um, spawning population. There's also a lot of examples where um, spatial and temporal closures can be used to protect spawning populations. Uh, Atlantic cod in New England waters has um, spawning closures that are target, uh, targeted at protecting uh, particularly spring um, spawning fish in um, certain regions of Mass Bay. Um, and so these are targeted um, to protect those um, spawning populations. We can also think about actually integrating our stock composition analysis um, into the assessment management process. And so here you're actually, you know, doing the um, stock composition work and integrating it into um, using it to parse data, to um, parse fish to the appropriate stock of origin before the data is being input to the stock assessment or used in management. And finally, at sort of the um, end of the spectrum of approaches, we can actually go and head and alter our stock boundaries, redraw them to improve the alignment between our biological populations and our management units. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about two examples um, that address uh, number four and five, examples that address number four and five on this list. So um, I've talked already about um, our work in Bluefin Tuna doing stock composition analysis where we're analyzing the chemical composition of the inner ear bone or the otolith. And um, we're using that information to determine the origin of fish, uh, whether they're from the west or the um, born in the Gulf of Mexico or from the east, born in the Mediterranean. And we're able to do that using the chemical composition. And we have these nice baselines that have been established uh, based on known origin fish. And the fact that there's strong differences in the chemical composition of the surface water, the surface waters between the two major spawning um, populations, that's what helps us to be able to do this um, work. And so we use this to, um, as I said before, identify the origin of fish. And now we've sort of taken this one step further. We've not only just identified um, the origin of fish, but we've done this in kind of an explicit way to try to characterize, recharacterize the data inputs to a stock assessment. So what you see here are the uh, listed on the right are the key um, fishery dependent indices that inform the Western um, bluefin tuna assessment. And here um, in black is the um, outline of the index and in the blue hash lines is actually a recreated, um, recreated um, indices that have now taken into account um, the mixed stock composition data. And so you can see that we have, you know, our perception of what the, um, of the stock 
the the um, index of abundance of the kind of mixed mixture of eastern western populations and black is higher than what we think the actual uh, west amount of western origin fish are within the stock unit which is in blue and we can re, um, re revise our catch at age information as well using this kind of information. And of course we do have some gaps in information here, but we're now committed moving forward to collecting this kind of information and do, um, that's gonna kind of allow us to better parse out, you know, in our um, fishery and the fishery for bluefin tuna in the Western stock, what is the actual proportion of fish that are um, of Western origin versus those fish that are Eastern origin or from the Mediterranean? So this kind of um, application of mixed stock analysis allows us to monitor mixed stock composition of the fishery in near real time, enables tracking of pressure, fishing pressure on Western origin fish, and can potentially inform management decisions aimed at controlling the population of origin, um, harvest of a population of origin. And of course, there's a potential to fit models to this mixed stock composition data. Um, this is just an example model that we fit to um, a VPA for the Western um, origin fish. Um, and you can see um, this is just an illustrative. So take the results with a grain of a grain of salt because we had to make some assumptions here where we had missing data. But it gives you the idea that when you're able to kind of revise the data inputs, of course, you're going to get a different perception of what your stock mixture is compared to your um, stock of origin um, um, in terms of you know spawning stock biomass, fishing mortality, and recruitment. So um, the second example I just want to illustrate here is what we what we can do with information that when we know there's misalignment is um, you know kind of a extraordinary example where um, the process actually went as far as to alter stock boundaries and this example is uh, one of beaked redfish in the Erminger Sea so this is an ICES example um, so prior to 2009 ICES provided advice for this stock uh, as two distinct units one that was a demersal unit. Uh, along the continental shelf around Iceland, and the other was sort of out a plagic unit out in the Arringer Sea, which is sort of uh, in between Greenland and Iceland there in this picture. Um, and this um, this stock had, there's a lot of debate back and forth for many years about this, you know the stock structure and the biological number of biological populations that existed for the stock. And it uh, ICES created this working group that one underwent this um, process of doing the kind of stock stock identity review of um, redfish. And the result of that um, identified actually three distinct stocks, a what was called a deep, uh, an Icelandic slope stock, which existed off the um, continental shelf of Iceland, a deep pelagic stock, which was genetically distinct from the shallow water pelagic stock. So, um, this was kind of an interesting example where there is a depth um, was defining, there was sort of a difference, a very different habitat use um, existing between the shallow water stock and deep water stock that were genetically distinct. Um, so this was the, so the result of the holistic stock ID review is, you know, there's not two stocks, but in fact three. And, you know, they kind of went into this process of, well, how do we deal with this? Um, because these biological stocks of redfish are defined by depth and habitat. This is a little challenging to think about drawing, redrawing boundaries for our stock units. Um, and really depth defined, they found that depth defined units weren't really gonna be practical in a, a management um, sense. So they, they were able to in fact draw, redraw new spatially defined management units. And they did this in a way that just minimized the um, mixed stock catches that would occur between these three different um, populations. And so you can see this in this map here, they redefined um, boxes between this one, two, and three uh, outlines here, um, redefined the management units and allowed for a better alignment between what we found um, was a population structure for beaked redfish uh, and their uh, management structure. Um, but as I said, there are, you know, these are a couple examples, but there are a lot of options out there for how you can deal with stock, uh, stock, you know, novel information about stock structure that, uh, that uh, leads you to this perception that you have this mismatch and alignment. And here I would say, you know, I think 
management strategy evaluation is one um, tool that can be really useful in allowing us to test um, the impact of a potential misspecification of stock structure in stock assessment and management and test the performance of alternative strategies to align the management units and populations. And it really allows you to do that in kind of a, um, kind of a, a simulator context, and, you know, in your computer, you can kind of test the performance of these different management strategies in a situation where there's no real negative consequences of poor choices before we kind of pursue making these changes on the water and in management. Um, you know, I, I will say, you know, that We've been, I have been involved in a lot, advising on a lot of these stock structure issues of the years, but it's still always um, very challenging to see this work make its way into the assessment and management realm and really see something as dramatic as what I showed you in the case of the redfish where actually stock boundaries re were redrawn. And um, so why is this? Um, and I think, you know, there has been in the past a lack of understanding of the consequences and costs of ignoring these phenomenon. I think that's changing. I see a lot more focus in the fishery management realm on stock structure and recognition of its importance and um, resolving some of these mismatches. There can also be some political, legal, cultural, and social pressures that can really prevent the revision of stock boundaries. One of the biggies is the fact that, you know, a lot of the allocation of our fishermen's quota is tied to historical patterns of fishing in a stock area. So that is one that's really tricky to, um, you know, work with because there's going to have to, if you go down that path, you're really going to have to rethink um, allocations, which is really challenging. Um, and I think, you know, we do, you know, I don't think we want to rush to uh, make dramatic changes because of the importance of some of these um, impacts that we really do need to take the time to carefully weigh the risk and reward of making changes um, to the management unit um, or to the assessment um, structure. And we need to understand what kind of the short term and long term benefits of um, these changes will be. So I think, I hope I've um, convinced you of kind of the value of population diversity can confer through the talk today. And, um, you know, really that increasingly coming to this realization that the goals of our sustainable fishery management can be really challenging to achieve. And sometimes um, we can find that we're not achieving these um, because the scale of our management units aren't matching the scale of our fish biology. And there's really a range, there's not like one uh, particular answer always um, when we find we do have this misalignment. I think I, I'm always um, a proponent of the fact that there's a whole range of options to moving from a factor, a place where we have real strong mismatches and inconsistencies to uh, better alignment. And there's different reasons to make those choices depending on your particular situation. Uh, but I think the critical component is data. We, we do need to do the work to do identify when we have mismatches and do this kind of work that involves mixed stock analysis to inform these type of approaches. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that, you know, I've referenced work today that I ha uh, many I've worked with with many collaborators over the year on uh, stock identification and mixed stock analysis. And I, I tried to start putting together an actual list and then I got too afraid of missing someone. So I I'll um, blanketly um, acknowledge them and I've uh, been involved through a lot of um, interesting workshops over the years and working groups that have really informed um, my thinking on this topic and have um, been very fun to be a part of over the years and a lot of funding that has contributed um, to many of the projects that I referenced today. So with that, I will be happy to take any questions. Um, and um, yeah, thank you very much for allowing me to talk today. Thank you, Lisa. And I apologize for those uh, those glitches during your presentation. No worries. Does anyone have any questions or comments they'd like to share with Lisa? Thanks for bearing with all my the, all the technical uh, <laughs> difficulties. Yeah, I'm going to need to figure out um, what's going on there. Because I tried to go in the um, the back end and assign folks, assign you specifically as the only speaker, um, and it couldn't find you apparently. Oh. <laughs> 
I'm glad someone's excited to see Tuna <laughs> talk. But yeah, I guess I'll, I'll wait for if anyone has a comment. But I think what's um, what's been exciting for me, who I've been a, kind of a part of some of this advising for a while, is you know I used to only do this for IC. Or, you know, a lot of these questions were coming up to the ICs groups I was a part of, and I wasn't seeing this be, be a real topic of conversation in the U.S. fishery management process. Um, and so I was sort of getting my fix of being involved with this process um, through ICs and. Uh, more recently, this is really ramped up in the US. And so I think it's really promising to see that we're acknowledging this. And um, particularly in the in the Northeast, we just went through a red, you know, this research track stock assessment process we have now just went through a red hake stock structure review and COD is coming up um, under review for, uh, we'll be going through the, the COD stock structure process, we'll be going through the uh, research track assessment. So it's exciting to see this work. Um, you know, moving from just the academic um, domain into the um, management domain. So one question I might have then for you is to, if, if you wouldn't mind maybe sharing your experience or, or what was your experience like making um, a transition from an academic um, type type setting as, as a PhD student to one where you are more uh, heavily involved in um, in the management of stocks. Like if, if someone thinks that's the trajectory that they are interested in pursuing, um, maybe what types of advice could you provide them? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think personally, I was just motivated to do that because I found, you know, a level of frustration and that, you know, I was doing what I thought was kind of cool research early on in my career. And it was sort of, net, it really wasn't having a great impact. And uh, it was, you know, really staying in the um, kind of literature, which is an exciting thing, you know, thing to do as well. But I was seeing, I was kind of not feeling a great amount of satisfaction with not seeing some of the work that I did, but also great, you know, other collaborators um, did making its way through that kind of um, assessment and management pipeline. And so, um, I think one one key thing was getting some experience. Um, you know, you really getting some experience in stock assessment modeling and kind of um, the process. You know, attending a lot of fisheries management meetings, kind of understanding the process and the models. So it's always helpful when you can translate some of this um, demographic information or life history information. If you can put it in their type of model that um, gets used in the assessment, that's really impactful to kind of show managers and to show stakeholders that it does make a difference to include these features. Um, and so um, to do that, you, you know, it's great to understand the models and be able to work with them. Um, yeah, I think I think one of the other recommendations is like, you know, it takes a long time to um, see impact, you know, things get in integrated. And uh, I've been a part of a lot of processes where we've been talking about this for years and it still hasn't been quite integrated. Um, so you have to be really persistent. You have to kind of enjoy being in those meetings for, <laughs> um, you know, many years to see the work actually make its way through. But I think, you know, there are certainly examples. And so, um, you know, it's, it's exciting when it happens and um, it does take a lot of persistence from, you know, scientists to kind of stay in that, you know, that management realm can be quite slow moving. Um, um, but, you know, if you keep getting back in there and presenting your science and kind of keep keep uh, translating it into the management impacts it can have is it's really um, can be um, rewarding in the long term. Yeah. I think Lisa Holst has a, a question for you. Sure. Hi. Hi, other Lisa. Hi. Hi, other Lisa. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I was just I was thinking about what you were talking about with um, you know, in a previous life with our agency. I worked for our division of marine resources and I had been in on a couple of those, you know, management meetings with the commercial fishermen. Um, and they got heated at times, uh, as you might imagine. So do you see for people that want to go into this field, I mean, obviously, I just know that the statistics involved in stock management and all of that stuff is a whole different realm. You know, we just had those those workshops in R, but marine stock management is like way out there. But 
the social science side of trying to move, you know, as was mentioned in, in our other, um, in, in Joe's talk too, about the social science side of, you are literally dealing with people's livelihoods and something that they feel strongly possessive of. You know, you hear comments like you're taking food out of my kids' mouths. Um, do you feel like people should get a background in some of the social science or at least an appreciation of how to deal with that when trying to present, you know, there's your science and then there's what people need and feel um, as far as their life goes. So, I mean, again, trying to figure out a good way yeah, to ask the yeah. question, but like, no, that's a great that, question. Has that, has that come into play for you? Do you feel like? Yeah, that's definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, I think, I got some experience with collaborative research. I think, you know, most, um, you know, really got deeply into it during my postdoc at um, UMass Dartmouth. And they have kind of a strong ethic of working with fishermen and kind of, um, as well as the institution I'm at now, um, the Gulf of Maine Research Institute is really relies on, you know, kind of taking the time to do the stakeholder engagement and talk to people and, uh, you know, or do research in collaboration with fishermen and uh, work off their fishing vessels if you're going to do a project. Um, so I think it was early on, I did get that experience and appreciation for collaborative work. Um, I feel it really acutely. I, I serve as a vice chair for our um, science and statistical committee for the New England Council. Um, and so your comment, you know, taking food out of my family's mouth, that's oftentimes we'll see um, those kind of comments at a fishery management meeting. And I think the challenge for us as scientists, um, you know, is sometimes um, that information is coming in late in the stage and then it's, it's, it's in this qualitative form that is hard to um, balance against the quantitative nature of say a stock assessment versus a, an anecdotal report of a fisherman. But, you know, I feel those comments are very deeply, you know, deeply impact me and, and we try to, you know, really listen and, um, try to understand if there's a science question or something that we can do earlier in the process to address the comment being made at the time. And, and um, I do, I think it, it does motivate me to try to work with stakeholders in my work and, and, and see if we can um, get them involved earlier in the process. So we're not sort of, um, I feel like sometimes we're in situations which we can't address the comment and uh, the way we can is bringing stakeholders into the process at the data collection, at the, at the defining a research question stage. Um, and so um, that's where, you know, it's, it's great to spend time to sort of do it early in the process so you don't get in these situations where um, I feel like you, you are hearing those statements and they are deeply impactful, but there's little that can be done sometimes at the very end of a process. But it is, I think probably uh, some social science training would be, you know, we, we have an increasing number of social scientists on the New England Council SSC. And it's really um, helpful to have their insights and their uh, context setting for folks who don't come from that background like myself. Thank you, Lisa. Does anyone else have questions or comments? Yes, uh, thanks, Lisa. Uh, I just have a question. You had said, um, something about fishery management councils buy into this in terms of setting up a work group to, you know, to elucidate the stocks in the Gulf of Maine, for instance. Um, have the fishery, have the councils themselves put in any goals in terms of timeframes where, you know, some of these things might actually, you know, be implemented or any sort of milestones or um, you know anything else besides just you know let's look at it let's look at it and you know incorporate it into everything we do you know it's almost uh, you know a real plan to do this to, to actually implement these things. Yeah, I mean it's a good it's a good question. I mean I think early on some of it was a little bit more um, you know you'd see reference to stock structure and you know, just sort of a, a qualitative paragraph about it in the assessment, but it wasn't really getting uh, fully drawn into, um, you know, the quantitative framework of the assessment or into, you know, decisions about management. So it was sort of being lightly treated, um, you know, in some cases, I think early, you know, in, in earlier years, but I think, um, 
I see more explicit work in, in um, getting this, moving this information into the kind of management pipeline. So for instance, for COD, we've been on a, we had a very explicit time frame and a two-stage process for the COD stock structure review, which we just wrapped up the kind of biological population structure review. And the challenge is always getting, you know, um, getting to the second phase, which is, okay, now what do we do with it? And so, uh, but we are now working with the council to put us on a timeline for integrating that information into the context of, uh, you know, the research track stock assessment for COD, and we're setting up some, you know, working groups that are going to identify these things, like I mentioned in my talk, like, you know, what are the options? Um, what's the data we have? What can we do with the data we have? Um, you know, and then, and then there's all the decisions that get made down the line of like, well, you know, what, what are the managers going to decide to do with this information about, you know, sort of what we think we can do with the best available science and how we can work it into the assessment. Um, but I am uh, heartened to see that there's, you know, a real, you know, in this process I'm going through right now, there's a real timeline and a push to uh, integrate and involve, you know, you got to always involve the council, NOAA, and, you know, kind of the experts in the field to do these kind of um you know, assessment, uh, move this information and kind of into the assessment and management realm. But thanks for the question. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions for Lisa? Standing between anyone, everyone in their lunch break. So I appreciate <laughs> even any questions. That's what <laughs> All right, going once, going twice. All right, folks, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. And thank you very much to our three plenary speakers that were willing to take time out of their day to be with us. Um, I think I speak on behalf of the chapter when I say it's very much appreciated, especially um, in the context of how busy everyone's and complicated everyone's lives have been um, over the past year. Um, so I will say that these um, presentations were were recorded. So if folks want to go back um, and have the opportunity to, to review these, they will be available um, probably on the chapter YouTube site. Um, and then I guess I'll, I'll wrap up by saying um, there's lots of content on the Whova site. I'm hoping that most of you have had the opportunity to at least um, bump around a little bit in it, but we have lots of um, pre-recorded presentations uh, and posters for folks to view. Please leave comments um, uh, for those uh, speakers. Many of them uh, are students who would appreciate the contact. And yes, please, if you are interested in um, helping to be a student judge, or a judge for those pre presentations, reach out to Brian Wydell. He left a message uh, in the chat with his contact information. Um, but that's that's pretty much it. So I hope you guys, um, I hope to see you again soon at one of our other live events. Um, and in the meantime, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. <laughs>